Okay, so what I'd like to do is welcome back to the second part of our lecture on nature versus nurture. Today we're going to take it nice and easy. I'm going to have a few slides for you, but mostly what we're going to do is we're going to bring in a guest lecture, uh, virtual via TED Talk for about a 15 minute talk on genetics. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie in that final message of <clears throat> this nature versus nurture discussion. So ultimately, one of the things that we're trying to do is to better understand in lifespan development how our behavior is impacted throughout our development by the developments, or sorry for using development so many times, but really by the evolution of how we change and shift in our physiology, in our psychology, in our cognitive thinking, right, in our, and in our relationships with others. So behavior really is a referring to a specific event in uh, an animal, in particular with us as human beings, right, that's important <clears throat> for us to understand. The definition of behavior is an observable or uh, observable activity in a human or animal. And, and really what it is, is it's the aggregate of responses to internal and external stimuli. So from the moment we are born, we are confronted with internal and external stimuli, right? Events that are, are shaping the way that we view and interact with the world that we have no control over. As we continue to age throughout the lifespan, we find that we can be exposed to the same stimuli, but our response may be different. And so that's important to understand. And so oftentimes, individuals in this field of research have argued in the past that it's all nature and no nurture, right? That it's all about the genes we've been born with. And that is what impacts our behavior above all else. Now, others have fallen on the other side of the argument. And what they've said is, no, it's primarily about environment that you may be born with certain genetics, but your environment ultimately shapes and influences your behavior. And some have obviously said it's been a mix of both. So what I wanna do is I wanna talk about really quickly some things that I've learned over the past 15 years in social work related to behavior. And then I'd like to pose you that same question of nature versus nurture that our researchers are so try, uh, uh, valiantly trying to determine, all right, who we are as human beings. A couple of things I've learned over the past 15 years regarding behavior is all behavior is the result of an unmet need. Okay, all of it. Bad behavior is the result of an unmet need. And I've seen this come into play, for example, when children who have been removed from their biological families and lived in what we refer to as group homes in the past, lived in, in residential care away from their families, had to have their needs met. And so what happens is, is that that child when they're being raised by a staff of three individuals, right? And, and their caregivers come in shifts because there's a morning shift and an afternoon shift, right? Is that individuals will begin to behave in ways, not because they want to be bad, but they, uh, uh, they behave in ways in order to get the attention that they need. And so sometimes I've seen where children going for, through very difficult times when they need nurturing and they need support, may choose to act out physically, right? To hit or to strike another child um, because they know that that behavior cannot be ignored and an adult will come to interact with them. And so all behave, bad behavior that I've noticed is a result of an unmet need. The biggest unmet need I've seen in the past 15 years of working with children and families has been loneliness. And I'm not talking about being alone, right? There's a difference between being alone and being lonely. Being alone is choosing to be secluded to be away from individuals. Introverts find energy in being alone. So I, I, at times, I'm an introvert. And I gravitate towards a notion of needing to be silent, right, and in a quiet place for a short period of time. That gives me energy and focus on where I head next. Now, loneliness is when you're absent of relationships. You're absent of belonging. You don't feel like you fit in anywhere. Loneliness is dangerous, right? And that leads to, or can lead to, bad behaviors. The most important lesson that I've learned all right, about human behavior is that all behavior, all of it is communicative, meaning all behavior is trying to articulate something to us. It's just happening through behavior and not necessarily words, right? So think about it for in this way for an example to kind of illustrate my point. What does a baby do when a baby is hungry? It cries, right? And what does a baby do when a baby has a, a dirty diaper? The baby cries, right? What does a baby do when the baby has a temperature? The baby cries. And what does a baby do when the baby is tired? The baby cries. And I can give you example and example of what babies do when they are confronted with external stimuli and the response is the same. 
because that child, that little baby, hasn't learned yet how to express itself in any other way other than crying. All behavior for that child is communicative. The only difference is it's being said through one primary strategy. Now, as we grow older and we're adults, we begin to communicate right, our needs very differently. Some of us communicate that in our words. We say things. Some of us communicate it in what we do. We do a combination of that, right? So we'll go out and act a certain way. Some of us communicate that through art. Some of us communicate through writing, right? Some of us communicate through cooking. Some of us communicate through hugs. And so what's important to realize is that all behavior is communicative. When you understand that and you're able to embrace that, it really helps depersonalize some of the negative behaviors you will be confronted with in your career. There will be times where clients that you are serving have been deeply hurt and scarred by trauma they've experienced in the past. And you know what they've learned has worked for them in terms of bad behavior and an unmet need? Sometimes that unmet need really is this fear of being rejected, this fear of being let down or hurt emotionally. And so you know what bad behavior emerges from that is aggression, um, negativity, right? Harmful words. So I've had some clients call me some really awful things throughout my career, the worst things you could think of. And really it wasn't because they were upset with me. In fact, they told me later, you know what it was? I was scared I was going to trust you. I was scared I was going to want to talk with you again next week. I was scared, right, that I thought that you would be a real positive force in my life and I was afraid of letting that happen. And so it was easier for me to push you away than for you to do that to me because I don't want to feel that pain anymore. So I hope that helps in terms of understanding uh, regarding behavior, right? So here's some things to consider, right? This nature versus nurture argument and where it comes from and where it goes, right? So, so some people, right, are genetically predisposed to obesity. So why bother diet at all? If you're a skinny person, why should you have to diet if you know that you don't have that gene for obesity? Well, we know that there's other consequences, right, to a diet. We know that falls outside of that, right? So you can be thin, right? But that doesn't mean that you're necessarily healthy. So there's still a need to maintain a proper diet. Here's another consideration. Are all straight A students genetically predisposed to genius or privilege? No, we know that, right? We know that it's entirely possible that individuals um, um, who are straight A students aren't all geniuses, right? I'm a testimony to that for sure. Uh, and we know that not all A students are privileged, right? So so again, nature versus nurture plays out differently here. What about um, you know, relationships? Are all relationships about looks? You know, it depends on where you're at in the lifespan development, right? At a typical age, when I was much younger, looks tended to matter very much to me, right? And I thought to myself, because I hadn't moved beyond this point in my life and my youth, that I thought that looks would be a foundation enough for a relationship. If if two people found themselves attracted to one another. That could be enough. But as we learn later throughout life, right, that, that the longer we're in a relationship, the longer we start to realize that compatibility must go farther beyond a physical attraction. That yes, a physical attraction may be a foundation uh, for some people pursuing a relationship, but relationships that last over a period of time have an emotional, right, and even a cognitive response uh, to one another. And so genetics, nature versus nurture, as you move older throughout the lifespan, later into your lifespan, you start to understand that the environment, the compatibility, the connection that you have with another human being matters less, all right, sorry, matters more, I'm sorry, than a physical attraction of nature, okay? Uh, let's look at cigarette smoking. So cigarette smoking we know is proven to cause lung cancer, but why is it that some smokers never develop lung cancer and how is it that some healthy individuals end up dying of lung cancer? How do we explain that as being all nature? How do we explain that as being all nurture, right? These are important questions that we ask. Here are some real topics throughout the course of my career that I have battled with, right? Regarding nature versus nurture, the notion of intelligence, right? Some people say, well, that, pers that person's in jail because they made bad choices and they were born that way. Well, maybe, but is it all nature? Is it nothing about nurture, the environment they were raised in, the home that they came from, the neighborhood that they were grew up in? Uh, we have to consider those things. Personality. You know, quite frankly, some people have asked me, why are there jerks and why are there good people? Is that a nature versus nurture thing? Gender identity and sexual orientation. Some people will say, well, look, it's a preference. Who you choose to love, how you choose to express your sexuality, that's a preference. Um, but if you talk to individuals 
who maybe fall outside the binary or traditional approach to gender expression and sexuality, they would say, it's not a choice. This is who I am, right? I, I don't voluntarily sign up for the discrimination that I face because I choose to love someone of the same sex. And so that is something to consider. And finally, substance dependency, a heavily debated issue, right? Some people believe that substance dependency is a... Um, is a uh, disease, right? And other people say there's no way that that's a disease. No one is forcing that bottle, right, to an individual's mouth. And so these are debates that go on back and forth. So what do you think? Is it more about nature or is it more about nurture, right? And this is something to consider. What do you think about that? I'm gonna give you a chance to answer that. And then what we're gonna do is in the next slide, I'm gonna ask you to watch a video on nature versus nurture from a researcher related to this topic. And then we're gonna end our lesson kind of bringing this all together. So think about it, what do you think? Is it more nature, more nurture? Whatever the case is, give that some thought. And then go ahead and move to the next slide to watch the video and then we'll pick up on the slide after that. today to talk to you guys about jeans. And when I say jeans, I don't mean that. I don't mean the jeans you're wearing, but rather the jeans you're carrying, your DNA. So to start off, I thought we'd talk really quickly about some things you might have heard about your genes that you're wondering about. And first of all, you might have heard that you share 99% of them with chimpanzees, which are our closest living relative. And that is absolutely true. You might have also heard that there is less DNA in you, in each of your cells, than there is in those of a humble onion. And that is also true. And lastly, who amongst you hasn't heard on TV or read on Facebook or on any other sources that scientists have discovered the gene for things like crime or maybe autism or cancer or beauty or attraction or really any other number of traits? Well, I'm going to tell you something, and that something is that that is wrong, and I'm going to tell you why. So these days, it's really, really fashionable to attribute all kinds of phenomenal powers to our DNA, to the degree that you might start to wonder if there is really any reason in trying to fight your genetic destiny. So what makes you you and makes me me is, the argument goes, innate. It's something you're born with. It's your DNA. And you know, some of you might actually find that comforting, because if you're destined to gain weight, no matter what, then you might as well enjoy yourself at lunch and stop feeling guilty about it, you know? Why try to fight this? Everybody knows you can't actually win against your DNA. But is that really true? You know, is your DNA really all that powerful? And this is a question you might have asked yourself before, and it's indeed a question you might have heard of before, because it has been referred to for a long time as the question of nature versus nurture. Okay? So, Sometimes it's very true that there is nothing you can do against your DNA. And let me give you a pretty sobering example, and it's that of Huntington's disease. It is a terrible, terrible disease, one in which the cells in your brain become damaged and slowly die, and so you irreparably lose your ability to control both your body and your mind. And there is a disease for which there is neither treatment nor cure. It is also a fully genetic disease. All it takes is a single damaged copy of a single gene. If you have that copy, you will get the disease. It is unavoidable. But not all diseases, and not all traits, in fact, behave like this. Just because one of your parents had cancer does not mean that you, too, necessarily will have cancer, even though you inherited half of your DNA from that parent. And the same is true, in fact, of many traits, traits like height and weight and even intelligence, and also of complex diseases, of things like diabetes or heart disease. For instance, you could be the child of the tallest two people on Earth, but if you were malnourished as an infant, it is extremely unlikely that you will be as tall as they are. So sometimes your life experiences trump your genes. Nice and easy. Sometimes nurture wins. And in fact, 
If you look back 50 years, 100 years ago, you'll find that most philosophers strongly denied that nature had any role in shaping humans. The only thing that mattered was nurture. The only thing that mattered was experience. Nothing about humans was innate. Now, both of those positions are actually rather extreme. If you stop to think about it for a second, you'll realize that sometimes when nature and nurture, when DNA and experience fight, the winner is really easy to predict. For instance, you can wish all you want for six fingers. If you were not born with six fingers, you will never have them. I'm really sorry to disappoint you. On the other hand, just because you cannot speak German today, there is nothing in your DNA at all that says that you cannot learn it if you start studying it tomorrow. So yes, sometimes the questions can, are easy to answer. Sometimes those are simple answers. But simple answers, are, although they are really, really tempting, are most of the time not right. And in fact, complex problems are far more common and, to me, far more interesting than simple ones. So I want to tell you a story about my doctoral work. So when I was a graduate student, I, I'm a human evolutionary geneticist. And what that means is like, that I'm really interested in understanding what bits of our DNA make us human and, that it, and how they do so. And when I was a graduate student, I focused on this bit of DNA here. And why this one? Well, it's clearly not very obvious from the sequence. And in fact, the reason is something you might not expect at all, because the reason is milk. That's right, milk. So milk is a really complex substance. It contains all kinds of things. But the one I'm really interested in is this molecule here called lactose. Lactose is a sugar, just like the glucose that your doctor tells you and your parents and your grandparents to keep an eye out so you don't get diabetes or like the fructose that makes fruits taste sweet. But lactose is found almost exclusively in milk. When you drink milk, it makes its way down your gut into your stomach, where your body recognizes it, breaks it down, and uses it to make energy to fuel itself. And you might remember from school that all mammals, from seals to pigs to lions, they all make milk to feed their babies. And in fact, baby sheep, baby gorillas, Baby sea otters, they all rely on their mothers to nourish them with milk at the beginning of life. But something happens to all of these adorable animals when they grow up, and, they, and that is that they lose the ability to digest lactose. They can no longer break it down, even kittens. So you can feed an adorable kitten a saucer of milk. He will, of course, drink it and lap it up, and he will be the happiest kitten you've ever seen, probably. But if you feed a grown cat a saucer of milk, he might drink it, yes, in fact, I can tell you, they will drink it. But believe me when I tell you, they are not digesting that lactose. They are not breaking it down. I have cats at home, so again, believe me when I tell you that I have seen, and I have smelled, and I have cleaned up proof of the fact that they are not digesting the lactose. <laughs> the only exception to this is some, but this is extremely important, not all, humans. So I am not a child, I hope you will all agree, although I can nonetheless digest lactose very comfortably. But because we are in Singapore, I feel really comfortable saying that the vast majority of you in this audience could not go home right now, drink a pint of milk, and not feel terrible for a while. That said, if you don't believe me, if you haven't done this experiment, please, by all means, do it. But don't just drink, oh, you know, a little sip of milk, or oh, a little pot of yogurt. No, 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 no. I want you to go home and pour yourself a nice tall glass of just plain cold milk, nice and full of lactose. And my guess is that you're all going to end up pretty annoyed at me for having talked you into doing that. But, you know, how do I know this? I mean, my job is not actually to go around and ask animals how much they like milk. And I don't know any of you, so I really don't know if you like milk. But how, so how am I so comfortable in my guess? Well, the answer is really simple, that bit of DNA that I showed you. In fact, it's that little C, the one in red there. That is something that I have that most of you don't, and that's because it's found primarily in people of European descent. You can see here in this map, which I took from some colleagues, Yuvani Tal and his friends, where that little C is most common in, in places like Britain and Northern Europe, and where it is least common in the world, which is pretty much anywhere in blue. You can also see that it's pretty much unseen 
east of India, which is the region I studied as a PhD student. That single C, that tiny little change, gives me the ability to digest, la digest lactose as an adult. So, on the surface, that would seem like a really clear case for lactose, for DNA winning everything, for DNA beating nurture again, right? I mean, a single difference, and I can do something you cannot. You have the, so I have the mutation, I can digest lactose. You don't have it, you feel sick. Case closed, right? I mean, clearly. But actually, let's take a step back, because there is one thing missing from this story. That's the milk. Where does the milk come from, you know? That bit is certainly not encoded by that little C. So the truth is, yes, I have a mutation in my DNA that lets me digest lactose. If I don't have access to cows, or to goats, or to sheep, or to camels, or to any other animal we can milk, that mutation is totally pointless. Being able to digest milk is a totally pointless ability if you have no access to milk. So maybe DNA is actually not that mighty. And let me give you another example. This one is a bit more somber, but I think you'll see what, I'm, what I mean. So here on this figure, you can see on this graph, you can see how common it was for American men to die of different types of cancer at different times in the 20th century. And I took this from a study from the Cleveland Clinic in the US, so the stats are for US men. As you can see, most of the 20th century, the most common form of cancer has been lung cancer, which is the one that I'm pointing to with the big red arrow over there, right? Now, cancer is a disease that is caused fundamentally by damage to your DNA that damages your body's abilities to control when and where your cells divide. So in a sense, cancer is caused by your DNA. So here we are again, DNA, genetic destiny. But actually, is that really true? Because we all know that there is a reason cancer has become so common in the past 50, 60, 70 years, and it's got nothing at all to do with DNA. What I'm talking about, of course, is the rise of smoking. In fact, if you look at the figure, you'll see that lung cancer was pretty uncommon in the US until cigarettes became widespread. And while not everybody who smokes will get lung cancer, and not everybody who gets lung cancer is a smoker, the fact remains that smoking dramatically damages the cells in your lungs, and that in turn dramatically increases your chances of getting cancer. So then, what causes lung cancer? Is it nature? Is it DNA? I mean, if we damage DNA, we get cancer. Maybe it's actually nurture. I mean, without smoking, without damage to your genes, there is no cancer. So if you don't smoke, you don't damage your genes, you don't get cancer. So perhaps you see, though, where I'm going with this, because my question to you today is actually, well, does this really have to be a fight? Do we really need to think of this as nature versus nurture, nature or nurture? I think it's really, really clear that actually it's nature and nurture. Because the truth is that, yes, you have genes, we all have genes, and these genes do all kinds of things, right? But if you look at a single gene, what it tends to do tends to be pretty small. A single gene might do something like make a protein that breaks down lactose. And in isolation, that's not really striking, you might say to yourself. That's a fair criticism. But the beauty of the system is that genes respond to each other. A gene can react to the product of another gene. But even more striking is the fact that genes not only respond to each other, they respond to other things as well. They respond to the environment in which you live. They respond to the food you eat. They respond to the decisions you make. While it's really, really tempting to have a simple answer, to have some yes or no, nature or nurture, you might also even want someone to blame in some situations. The truth is, life is quite messy. That's not how life works. Life is really complicated. So the next time you see, science, you see a newspaper headline that says, oh, scientists have discovered the gene for cancer again, please keep in mind that what that article really means is that scientists have discovered a gene for cancer that is associated perhaps with higher likelihood or even less likelihood of getting cancer in a given environment. Because the truth is, there is no single gene for cancer. There are many genes, always many genes, that control, yes, your likelihood of getting cancer, but also things like your height, your weight, the shape of your face, the color of your skin, even the likelihood of you suffering from major depression at some point in your life. 
okay? But without the wrong environment, likelihood and chances is all they will ever be. And so I want to leave you with this final thought. Despite what you might have heard before, you are not the battleground upon which nature and nurture fight. No, 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 absolutely not. You are the canvas upon which they collaborate. You are the product of their interactions. So I hope you found that video um, helpful. I think one of the things that I really enjoy about that video is that what it really does, it drives home the fact that, that nature versus nurture is not an either or, right? It is a both and. It is a combination of nature and nurture that drives our lifespan development, our understanding of the world, and as a result, our behaviors within it. And so what does that mean for a daily practical approach to nature versus nurture? Again, I've given you this large blanket umbrella concept uh, related to psychology of nature and nurture. It's, it's, a, it's a time uh, memorial um, uh, debate, right, of what dominates our discussions. And what, what does all this mean for our practitioner-based understanding of nature versus nurture as helping professionals. So one thing to consider is, is that our job is to treat the patient, which means the entire patient. And so patients are going to come to us physically, emotionally, and spiritually and well. They just will. They're going to be hurting in one or all of these arenas. And so great professionals may prescribe medicine, right? If you're a psychiatrist or you're a, uh, a health professional, you may determine a treatment plan. If you're a clinician or a social worker, right? You can provide services if you're a teacher or a tutor or whatever the case is. But great professionals in the helping profession also administer hope. And that's what's really important to understand. And so what we've learned from nature versus nurture in modern times now is that really it is a combination of both that impact our behavior and our understanding of the world around us through all of our lifespan. And so we are not the sum of our genetics, nor are we the victim of our circumstances, right? So think of a time when you were reduced down to a label, meaning someone judged you, they called you a name, they treated you a certain way simply because of one aspect of your identity, right? Maybe it was your race, maybe it was your gender, maybe it was your size, maybe it was your sexual orientation or your gender expression, whatever the case is, your age, right? And remember how that, that made you feel that someone saw you as only one piece of who you were and judged you on that moment, right? How did that make you feel? Think about that. So for example, you know, I'm, I'm diabetic. I'm a, I'm a type two diabetic. Uh, but if someone said, oh, that's Antonio the diabetic, I wouldn't like that very much, right? Because yes, I am diabetic, but I am not a diabetic. That is not all of who I am, right? I'm a father, I am a husband, right? I'm a Christian, right? I'm a professional. And so I am more than the sum of my diagnoses, right? Children aren't autistic. So we don't refer to children as that's an autistic kid, right? We say that is a child with autism because they're, the fact that they are a child honors more of who they are as an identity than simply that they are autistic, right? And so we have to be careful when we use this language in the helping professions. We can't categorize people into large groups because what that does is that takes away from who the being, human being is as a whole person. Right? So we can't talk about people who are fatzos, blacks, whites, Asians, gays, youngsters, or old geezers, because what that does is that negates them down to one aspect of their identity. Right? And so we need to lose the humanity of that person. It's also important to understand why we avoid this talk, because who we are today is not who you will be when you graduate. I guarantee that. Right? And that's the beautiful part of life, right? that the individuals you're going to interview who are 65 and older... Um, they're not who they were today. Let's say you interviewed them today. They weren't who they were 20 years ago and they weren't who they were 40 years ago, right? They have evolved over time. You're seeing that snapshot of their lifespan development. And so finally, um, um, we're going to go ahead and on the next slide, we will engage in the centering activity and we will close out our lesson for today. Okay, so finally, what we're going to do is we're going to finish out the end of this lecture with our centering activity, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to engage in our centering. 
for just two minutes. And we are going to utilize a scripture verse from Peter. And again, sorry about the um, voice thread problems right here. I apologize for that, but don't worry. I've got our word for today. So for um, our scripture verse for today it comes from 1 Peter. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you, right? And let's call our scripture word for today faith, right? So what does it mean? What is God speaking into your heart for the next two minutes to be faithful in the fact that you can hand him all of those worries, all those concerns, and you can let those go, right? And he wants you to do that because he cares for you. He wants you to live outside of this anxiety and outside of this fear. So let's go ahead and make sure that our hands and feet are in a nice, comfortable position. And let's go ahead and remain focused on the fact, right, that God is with us right now in this very moment. And we needn't worry or have any anxieties for what comes after this, because God's present with us when we're done, even with this centering, right? So go ahead and take that nice deep breath. Go ahead and close your eyes. And I will keep track of the time and come back to us in two minutes. Okay, so go ahead and take that nice deep breath and open your eyes. Welcome back. I want to say thank you all truly so much for engaging in the lecture today. I hope you found it useful. As always, please be sure to email me if you need anything. Um, jump onto Blackboard, check out those assignments and those due dates so you know what's coming next. And uh, know that I am praying for you every day. Keep plugging away. You're doing great. Um, and I look forward to talking to you in the next lecture. So thank you.